Good evening. This is Reverend Al Shopton. I'm at National Action Network's uh, downtown office, and we are having this webcast to really give you information around this outrageous circumstance that we find ourselves in. And we felt that with a lot of misinformation, everything from conspiracy theories to just misinformation, that we would try and have this so that you could raise your questions and you could get the information that is absolutely correct so that we can conduct ourselves in an appropriate way that would in many ways add to the possibilities of keeping our families healthy and keeping our loved ones secure. Uh, it is very important during this time where there's understandable anxiety and uh, in some cases, extreme nervousness, that we operate in a responsible and adult manner and that we operate with the right information. Uh, we, we were hunting humans for sports tonight. Uh, a panel of health experts. We have uh, Dr. George Benjamin, who's the executive director of the American Public Health Association. Uh, Jennifer Cottle, who's a family medicine physician and associate professor uh, in the Department of Family Medicine at Rowan University School of Osteopathic uh, uh, Osteopathic medicine and Dr. William F. Tate, who's the Dean of Graduate School of Arts and Science and the Vice Provost at, uh, for Graduate Education and Professor of Education uh, of African American Studies. Uh, so we have a, a panel of experts to deal with all of our health questions and uh, what we ought to be doing, not be doing, what we should be aware of and not aware of. And uh, we are going to start with Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, who can give us what the legislative attempts are, what the pro uh, process is. We saw there was a $2 trillion uh, stimulus package passed this week first by the Senate in the House. And certainly, that's the first of other steps. Uh, Senator Kamala Harris was on uh, Politics Nation with me tonight. And last night, the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, Karen Bass, was on. Uh, but I know Hakeem Jeffries, who's one of the four uh, leaders of the Democratic Caucus of the House of Representatives. And he is a uh, congressman representing uh, Brooklyn, New York. And he's a member of National Action Network. And I know that he would give us the right information and the right forecast. There's a lot of concern about what this stimulus bill really means. Uh, we hear about people getting money. When and how will that happen? Uh, what are the safeguards on corporations not benefiting from it, like we saw abuse in the 08 uh, bailout? And we need to know real deal stuff. Any questions you have, you'll be able to get them in. And I've asked uh, from our staff, Dr. Jamal Watson, uh, we'll be fielding uh, the questions as well as uh, we are joined by uh, Grace Possinger, who is a uh, 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 post in girl, I'm sorry. I always have your name wrong, Grace. Uh, they will be helping to field the questions. But first, the $2 trillion stimulus. What does it do? What does it not do? Where do we go in the next steps with the legislature? What do we need to do to put pressure as activists? National Action Network is an activist organization. Do we need to put pressure on some of our senators and Congress people for next steps? And what is the timeline that people are going to get their aid? What happens to people that get $1,200, but they may end up two to three months behind in their bills and their rent and their mortgages? We saw tonight President Trump uh, announced that he was extending to April 30th uh, the, the whole uh, emergency situation that he had announced. He had first projected Easter. Now he's gone to April 30th, and he assured us 100 times he was doing a wonderful job. But let me get away from my uh, Trump analysis and go to Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. Thank you for being with us, Congressman. Well, good evening, Rev. Uh, as always, thank you uh, for having me on in this format at this very difficult time for all of us. 
Uh, and I certainly greatly appreciate your continued leadership and leadership of the National Action Network and standing up uh, for those individuals throughout America uh, who really need assistance at this particular time, as well as information. I mentioned on the House floor on Friday during the debate uh, in connection with the CARES Act that America uh, is the strongest nation in the history of the world, also the wealthiest, but we can't judge uh, the greatness of America based on our wealth or our military might. We should only judge America through how we stand up for the least, the lost, and the left behind. And that's what you have done uh, decade after decade uh, in such a phenomenal way as one of our leading civil rights uh, leaders throughout the nation. So I appreciate you. Uh, it's an honor to be on with all of these distinguished panelists. Uh, let me just make uh, this opening observation in terms of the CARE Act. As House Democrats, our objective was to focus uh, on three categories of individuals who we felt like needed immediate assistance. Uh, displaced employees, everyday Americans, and small businesses. Let me start with everyday Americans. In terms of the direct payment, as hopefully everyone knows, uh, the legislation authorizes a direct payment of $1,200 to every individual American who makes up to $75,000. Uh, now, if you make up to $99,000, you're eligible uh, for a direct payment as well, uh, but it will be reduced uh, by approximately $250 for every additional $5,000 that you make above $75,000. So for instance, if you make $80,000, as an individual, uh, instead of being eligible for a $1,200 direct payment, you will receive a $950 direct payment. In terms of married couples, uh, if as a married couple, uh, you make up to $150,000, uh, then you're eligible for a $2,400 direct payment. And as an individual or as a married couple, uh, eligible for an additional $500 per child up to two children. So for instance, if you're an individual who makes up to $75,000, you have two uh, minor children, uh, you will receive a total payment of $2,200. Now, there's no paperwork that is required in order to receive uh, this direct payment as long as you have filed taxes uh, either this year or last year and have a social security number. Most importantly, uh, the direct payment uh, can be made not just to individuals who are citizens, but to legal permanent residents as well, as long as you have a social security number. The last point I'll make on the direct payment, uh, Rev, is that people who are retired and receive social security or disability assistance from the government are also eligible even if they don't have income through another source because they are retired. That's been a frequent question uh, that many people in the community uh, have asked. So that's the direct payment. The second category briefly uh, that I'll discuss is the unemployment insurance which we enhanced over the objection of many Republicans. Now we've done that in two different ways. Under normal circumstances, someone who has been furloughed or let go from their job, and we know there are millions of Americans facing this right now, are eligible for 26 weeks of unemployment assistance. We've extended that by an additional 13 weeks. And so any individual who finds themselves in a circumstance where they've been let go, furloughed um, from their job because of this crisis, will be eligible for 39 weeks of unemployment assistance. The other thing that we've done is that we have enhanced the initial payment of unemployment assistance. The average amount that people receive in the nation, and this varies by states, is approximately $400 per week. What we have done is that we have uh, bolstered that amount by an additional $600 per week through July 31st. In other words, if you're unemployed and you file a claim 
and you are traditionally eligible for approximately $400 per week, uh, you will receive $1,000 per week through July 31st, and then thereafter eligible for uh, the traditional payment until you're able to secure employment uh, for up to a total of 39 weeks. Lastly, on the small business category, uh, the most important thing to note uh, is that the fund, which is in excess of $350 billion, uh, is in the form of federally guaranteed loans that are available to businesses of 500 or less. However, if the business commits to maintaining its payroll, despite the fact that it may have been directed to shut down, but if it maintains its payroll and takes a loan, that loan uh, is then converted effectively to a grant by the federal government because the loan will be forgiven. <clears throat> what is the method that one gets their payment? You said that if they paid their te file taxes uh, this year or last year, is it going to go by the IRS going by the tax rolls? Is there some way they apply? What is the people that are watching? We have hundreds of people on. How do they know that they are going to get a payment? Or do they have to go to some site to apply? Or is it automatically based on tax returns? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Rev. And our objective was to try to make this as easy as possible because we know that this has been very disruptive and we want to get hands into, uh, we want to get money into the hands of the American people uh, quickly. And so if you have filed your taxes or are a Social Security recipient, there's no paperwork that you have to file. Uh, if you have filed taxes using um, electronic means that have been available to you, uh, then you will receive your check via direct deposit. If you have filed your taxes in a traditional way, uh, then you will receive your check in the traditional way, meaning it will be sent in the mail. Now, if you fall into the category of uh, haven't made enough to file taxes in either 2019 or this year in 2020, you are still eligible uh, to receive a check. However, the IRS is going to provide guidance over the next week or so as to what the process will be for you to provide the Department of Treasury with information so that you can receive your check. Because if you haven't uh, had to file taxes in the last two years, then they don't necessarily have your most accurate information available to them. Now, what is the timeline that people are looking at to receive their direct payment or, or traditional uh, payment? Uh, what what would you estimate people should be looking for their checks or their uh, uh, direct deposits? We have urged uh, the Treasury Department and the IRS to move expeditiously. Now, this is a country of 330 million people, uh, and so a significant number of those folks are eligible uh, to receive the direct payment. And so what they've said to us, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, is that he expects that the checks will be out no uh, no more than three weeks from the date of when the legislation was signed into law, which was this past Friday. We're hoping that they can do it sooner, uh, but the time horizon that has been given to us is that the American people can expect to receive uh, their check within the next three weeks. <clears throat> Will the Congress be monitoring the Treasury Department to make sure this process is moving along swiftly and fairly? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we'll be monitoring them throughout. Uh, and in your opening observations, Rev, you also made an important point in terms of making sure uh, that Congress also has put into place and follows up on mechanisms to monitor the uh, assistance that has been also set forth in another part of the legislation for larger businesses greater than 500 uh, employees. And there have been three areas where we put something into place to make sure that we didn't see the type of abuses that we saw connected to the 200, 2008 uh, bailout that occurred uh, for many of the financial services companies. The first thing was that any business that receives assistance from the federal government cannot use that assistance for stock buybacks to pay executive bonuses 
or dividends to their shareholders. Because our view is that this effort is designed to help the working class, not the investor class. Uh, so that's one guardrail that has been erected. The second guardrail uh, is that there is a five member commission that will be appointed by the legislative leaders in the House and the Senate uh, to monitor and preside over the process of assistance being provided to major corporations throughout America. And that's unique. That didn't exist uh, 10 plus years ago. And finally, uh, we have put into law the creation of an inspector general who will have the subpoena authority to monitor the process of the decisions that are being made by the Trump administration in terms of what companies they have chosen to help. We want it to be evidence-based. We don't want it to be the friends and family of Donald Trump. <clears throat> now, there was some discussion that the inspector general and a con congressional oversight uh, was uh, that the inspector general was going to be compromised in the sense of the Trump administration telling them uh, the Congress what it wanted to. How do we safeguard against that and, and know that we are getting the uh, right information to the Congress and to the inspector general as we deal with these major corporations that have excess of 500 employees? Yeah, this is a very important point. After President Trump signed the CARES Act into law on Friday, as you know, Rev, he issued a signing statement uh, where he indicated that presumably based on advice that he received from Attorney General uh, Bill Barr, which is a whole nother story that we don't have time to go into in terms of how reckless he's been, uh, but that he did not necessarily have to abide by the attorney general provision in the law. That's an extraordinary thing in that you have a federal statute that he signed into law and then issues a statement saying he didn't have to abide by it. Uh, we're hopeful uh, that he will think twice about that statement and the recklessness inherent in it. We're also hopeful that the Senate, which has to confirm any attorney general I'm sorry, any inspector general that is presented uh, for confirmation by the Trump administration carefully vets that individual uh, so that that's an individual who has the intelligence, uh, the independence, and the integrity necessary to help safeguard the uh, American taxpayer dollars that will be part of this big business assistance fund. The question of the 1200 will only sustain people for a short period of time. Uh, do you foresee having to go into a second stimulus bill and when and how will that be determined? I certainly think that it's gonna be necessary to move beyond uh, what was done in this particular instance because we're facing an extraordinary pandemic, the likes of which certainly haven't been seen in this country since uh, 19, 18, if at all, uh, the last time the influenza really uh, hit the American people hard and millions of people uh, lost their lives here and across the, across the world. Um, Congress will be out of session uh, for the next several weeks, but it's my expectation, as Speaker Pelosi has indicated, that now that we've done phase three, we got to move to phase four. Phase three, the CARES Act, was largely about direct and immediate relief to the American people to try to stabilize the situation. Phase four, which is what we're referring to the next bill as, first two things that we've done, phase one and phase two, were usually more about public health assistance and infrastructure. Uh, phase four, I think, is gonna have to inject some stimulus into the economy. Uh, and many of us believe that an additional round of direct payment is likely. But again, keep in mind, every single American who meets the income criteria, which is the majority of American adults, uh, are going to receive a direct payment check, even if you have not lost your job. Separately, those who have lost their jobs uh, will receive the direct payment check, but also are eligible 
for the enhanced unemployment insurance. And it's going to be necessary to keep that going as we move forward. <clears throat> there are the, there's the conversation about uh, shelter in place. Uh, and then the president had thrown out and then withdrew about quarantining, uh, 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 quarantine in uh, the tri-state area of New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey. What are you encouraging people, of course, to stay home, stay home from work other than those that work in essential places? Will there be, in your uh, judgment, any enforcement problems? Because, as you know, a lot of our concerns is also protecting people's civil liberties as we encourage them to do what is healthy and advised. Uh, where are we on the uh, making sure that this does not end up in some period of time, some kind of enforcement situation? Well, this has been an important issue that Nan you know, has worked on for a substantial period of time that you, of course, Rev, have led on in terms of making sure that the civil rights and civil liberties of everyday Americans, particularly uh, traditionally disenfranchised communities, African-American community, communities of color, which tend to be systematically targeted uh, by law enforcement in ways that have been historical and well-documented, that this is not another opportunity for law enforcement overreach. Now, the enforcement mechanisms that exist in place are going to be state by state. And so, for instance, the governor of the state of New York will largely be the vehicle through which uh, any social distancing, uh, any stay at home orders, which right now are strong recommendations, uh, not necessarily uh, recommendations that, if violated, lead to imprisonment. But Mayor de Blasio has indicated, for instance, in the city of New York, uh, that for businesses and even religious institutions, those who have been found uh, to violate the order not to con congregate in large numbers could be subjected to fines. Uh, I've suggested to City Hall that at oh, least in the context of the houses of worship, that that's a fine line that has to be walked, that while we want to discourage these uh, larger gatherings in the interest of everyone's health, uh, to find people, uh, particularly those uh, who are worshiping in the way that they've been used to worshiping, either at a mosque or a synagogue or a church, seems to me to have some constitutional implications that we have to be very careful about. <clears throat> All right, before I let you go, because I, I, I respect your time, uh, do we have any questions, Dr. Watson or Grace, that? we need to raise to the congressman from our uh, webinar audience. Uh, yeah, one of the questions that came in was really focused on Black churches and whether or not um, there could be any financial assistance for religious communities. It's an excellent question. I talked to Senator Schumer about this two days ago. I held a conference call for clergy clergy and spiritual leaders from throughout Brooklyn on Thursday, more than 200 leaders were on the call. And they are obviously very concerned because uh, the, the order essentially not to conduct services because of the social distancing that is required uh, has led to a situation where if folks aren't worshiping on Sunday, they may not be contributing their tithes and offering. Certainly they're not doing it in the traditional way with the plate being passed. Now, some of our churches are equipped to receive tithes and offerings electronically, many are not. As a result of that fact, uh, there's gonna be significant distress economically that our churches and houses of worship may find themselves in. The challenge that we face from a governmental standpoint is because of the uh, constitution and the separation of church and state. Traditionally, even in the context of a disaster, uh, the Congress and the federal government is prohibited from providing direct assistance to houses of worship, mosques, or synagogues. But there are some things that we can do. We've been talking with the banking community uh, to pause mortgages. We've been talking to uh, the utilities, and your, your leadership uh, in this regard, Rev, I think is going to be important moving forward, talking to some of the utility companies in terms of making sure there's no ongoing disruption uh, if for whatever the reason, given the financial distress, 
utility payments are not made. We want to make sure that these churches can get up and running as soon as possible uh, and is a seamless transition when we're back to some degree uh, of normalcy. Uh, and to the extent that the church doesn't own its property, though many do, uh, we also want to make sure that there are no eviction proceedings, for instance, that could be initiated if a rental payment is missed. So there are some steps that I think we're going to have to take to provide financial relief albeit uh, it may have to be more indirect uh, than what is being provided directly to the American people. <clears throat> Let me ask this. Uh, I had talked uh, last week with President Trump about testing of those that are homeless and that are incarcerated. And uh, we've been uh, in partnership uh, with the uh, World Kitchen, uh, uh, World Central Kitchen people giving out food every day, 12 to 4 at our headquarters in Harlem and our New Jersey uh, Tech Center, Reverend uh, Bartley and Reverend Amir in Irvington. And there's uh, those in Detroit and LA chapters doing things of that nature. And I, a lot of homeless people have come forward. What are we doing to test them? They can't stay home because they don't have homes. Many of them not in shelters. And what are we doing about the incarcerated? Yeah, so th this is a big challenge uh, that the country confronts and that states are handling on uh, an individual basis based on the jurisdiction that they may have in the context of the homeless uh, communities. Uh, and we certainly are urging that states and, locality, states and localities use some of the resources that the federal government is providing, and we need to provide more to New York City, New York State, and other uh, states and localities across the country. Uh, that They use part of that to make sure sure that we are testing and if necessary providing treatment uh, to vulnerable individuals in the homeless community and certainly in the incarcerated community which presents a particularized challenge senator harris senator book and myself just introduced legislation on friday uh, that would would direct the bureau of prisons at the federal level to release uh, any pregnant women uh, to release individuals who are elderly and no longer pose a risk to public safety, to release individuals who are at the tail end of their sentence, and to release any individuals who have a pre-existing condition and don't present a threat to public safety as well. Because the incarceration context is the exact opposite of social distancing. Uh, and it could become a dangerous Petri dish so it makes sense for everybody to relieve some of the strain. Many of our prisons, as Chairwoman Bass has talked about, are overcrowded uh, or overstressed. And we need to release that in instances where you cannot, you will not undermine public safety, uh, but enhance the ability uh, of the prison system to deal with the coronavirus epidemic pandemic uh, appropriately. All right. Thank you very much for spending this 30 minutes with us, Congressman. And uh, we will stay in touch with you. And you know, we will be supporting you and, and the others that have been championing the concerns of our community on Capitol Hill. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Ralph. All right. Let me go to our panel. Uh, let me first ask Dr. George Benjamin of the American Public Health Association to give us some opening remarks in terms of the health aspects of the coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic, what we ought to be aware of, what does, what is the coronavirus? How can people uh, be uh, mindful of, of symptoms or not? Uh, when should people be tested or not? What should we be aware of or not? Well, thank you, Rev. And, and um, Congressman Jeffers, thank you very much for, for your work uh, with the Congress as well. Um, Thank you. So this is a new infectious disease um, that has been sweeping the whole planet. Um, we get it um, primarily through um, respiratory spread, although we now know, just like um, any other um, infectious disease, that if you ends up on a doorknob or um, other surfaces for probably a day or um, a few hours, um, it can be passed. Um, but primarily, the spread is through um, a respiratory contact, which is why we encourage everyone to, first, first of all, frequently wash your hands um, for 20 seconds. Secondly, covering up your nose and mouth when you cough or sneeze, um, because that, again, is how 
um, it is spread from someone who is infected. Um, usually um, the infection, once you get it, um, uh, starts showing symptoms in somewhere between two to five days. Uh, and those symptoms are sore throat, um, sneezing, uh, muscle aches, uh, you may get a high fever. Um, and um, the challenge of course is, is that it, it, it looks very much like uh, early on a common cold or um, or it looks like the flu um, very early on. Um, most of us know that this disease, believe this disease, um, lasts like most of these around seven to 10 days, but um, 14 days is generally the, the entire period that most of us may be infectious because we're not real sure exactly when you get it or when, you, when, it's, when it's over. So we're really looking at about a two week period that we think that people who have this disease um, pose the greatest risk. Or if you're exposed to someone um, during that two week period, um, you're, you should self isolate yourself or self quarantine yourself um, so that you don't um, share that with others. It is um, primarily symptomatic treatment. We don't have a vaccine. We don't have any kind of antiviral agents for this yet. Although the scientists are actively, actively working on it. But we will probably have a vaccine for anywhere from 18 to 24 months. Maybe some antiviral agents by the end of the year, or maybe even a little sooner. Um, but right now it, it's, it's through um, supportive care. Um, the good news is that about 80% of people that do come down with the disease um, have a very bad illness, but they, they pretty much do okay. They, you don't, you don't uh, die for that population, but 15 to 20% of the people who do come down with this can get very sick. Um, people who are uh, age 60 or older with chronic diseases like diabetes or hypertension or heart disease or lung disease uh, tend to do worse than others. Now, I wanna be careful how I say that because we now know that um, even young folks can get this and get pretty sick. Um, we used to think that only the older folks got, got very sick, but it turns out that at least in the United States, we're seeing a lot of young people um, that are getting this and, and getting sick. So all of us need to protect ourselves. Um, so the, the strategy right now, in summary, is that we are trying to do what we call social distancing, which means staying as far away from one another as we possibly can, staying in our houses to avoid being exposed to someone who has the disease. So um, instead of using this funny term, social distancing, I'm telling people now, um, the therapy for this is to stay at home, wash your hands frequently, cover up your nose and mouth when you cough and sneeze. And if you have um, any of those symptoms that you should immediately call your, your physician um, or your, your, um, your health plan, because um, a lot of those, those insurance companies have a, have a ask a nose program that you can actually call and get advice as to whether or not you, know, you need to be tested or not. Um, we are testing people who have um, um, symptoms. People who are in the hospital are, those are the primary prior, priority um, populations that are being tested right now. Um, more and more, there are more and more tests available, but not nearly enough yet. Uh, and we're hoping that we, at some point, will be able to give everybody who really needs to get a test and everybody who um, would like to get a test to get their test. But right now we're not there yet. <clears throat> All right, let's hear from Dr. Jennifer Cardo. Cardo. Yes, that's correct. Yes, that's correct. Yes, go, give us an overview uh, from your vantage point about what we should be aware of, what should we do, not do. And I'm, I'm very curious as to when do we know we should go in to get tested? Because we're hearing some people say that you should wait and see if you have symptoms for four days. Is that correct? Uh, but then we're hearing people that had no symptoms end up having it and, and end up very sick and even some dying. So what is what what should we be aware of? Uh, and And what is the process that we should put ourselves through to determine whether we should go in and try to get a test? 
Sure. Um, so I, I want to thank you for having me, and again, want to apologize for my video, <laughs> my video issues here. Still working on them, but I would love to weigh in on this uh, answer. I'm a family physician, and uh, I appear um, extensively on the news talking about this issue. And um, the gentleman before me, uh, Dr. Benjamin, uh, was very accurate when he said that we are prioritizing testing for those people who are hospitalized and those people with symptoms. What that means right now is that if you don't have symptoms, then we're not recommending that you go and get tested. Uh, yes, you're right, Reverend, that you can spread the condition even if you don't have symptoms, but we don't have enough test kits to test everyone, those people in the hospital, those people who are symptomatic, as well as those who don't have symptoms. So that's why we're prioritizing that. So in general, um, people who are at higher risk, who are hospitalized, who have symptoms, et cetera, are those that should be tested. Um, it also varies a little bit by state and local sort of jurisdiction. What I am telling people, and even my patients, I'm seeing patients through telemedicine now, I'm telling my patients and, and other people when I do videos on social media, that if you are concerned that your symptoms may be coronavirus related, or you're worried about some exposure maybe to someone else with coronavirus. I say the first thing you should do is hunker down and stay in place and then call your doctor right away. Call us so that we can talk you through where you fall on this sort of algorithm. If you are at high risk and need to be tested, if you don't need to be tested, if you need to be quarantined because you might have been exposed to somebody who was COVID positive, et cetera. We do not recommend that people go into the emergency rooms or go into offices, uh, doctor's offices, to try to get their symptoms evaluated. The reason for that is that if you are in fact symptomatic with COVID-19, you could potentially uh, put other people at risk and expose other people. So the most important thing right now is if you are concerned about your symptoms, again, call your doctor. If you don't have a doctor, the public health departments are helping out uh, in many ways with this. But uh, social distancing and social isolation is one of the best things that we can do. Uh, Reverend, you asked about um, in addition to who needs to be tested, you also asked me sort of what where my vantage point is, my, my perspective on this. Um, as a family doctor and, and somebody who, um, you know, I, I focus on giving information to the public, um, you know, I feel like there's a lot of myths, misunderstanding, and a lot of sort of pseudoscience that's floating around around COVID-19. What, what I mean by that is a lot of people are not adhering to social distancing. There are many people who don't think it's that big of a deal. Uh, there are many people who uh, may not quite understand the spread, and these are things that I'm working hard to educate, you know, the public about. Uh, but social distancing, you know, I, re I really, really mean that, that we need to stay six feet away from other people. We need to stay home. We need to socially isolate. We need to wash our hands, et cetera. Um, that's, that's something I feel very, very, very strongly about, and I, I wish the whole country would would uh, take it equally as seriously um, as some of the other places like New York and, and, and Washington, et cetera, so the spread doesn't continue to get worse. <clears throat> All right, Dr. Tate, uh, would you give us some opening statements? Right, so I think, uh, first of all, thank you for having me and thank you for your advocacy. I'm, I'm um, wanna piggyback on something that the Congressman said about stabilization because the way I think about what we're dealing with in the context of a pandemic is a triage stage and post-triage. And, and usually we think about that in terms of hospitals, but all of our institutions are in triage mode, higher education, K-12 schools, they're all triaging. And in the context of triage, stabilization is foundational. And post-triage, I think it's extremely important to think about um, evaluating where we are and then reallocating resources so that we can be successful. This pandemic, without a uh, cure, is going to be with us for two years. So it's going to be a, a slide up, we're going to go up, and it's going to go down if we social distance. And then if we bring people back together again, it's going to go up again until we have a cure. And so we've got to start thinking about all the institutions in our society that had cracks before we got started, K-12 schooling, how many young people actually don't have access to the internet right now? Here in St. Louis, I know that the majority of African-American students who live in North St. Louis don't have access to the internet. So that means they can't do K-12 schooling. How long is that going to last? What are we gonna to do to make sure that they have access? What are we gonna do with the young people in the fall who are gonna head off to college, some of our best and brightest? They may not have access in the ways that they historically have had because they don't have internet access at home to do distance learning for school 
All of these things we have to begin to attend to while we're triaging and stabilizing, evaluating where our cracks in society are and intervening appropriately so that we can go on as much as we can normally. Because I, I, I'm really worried. I, I also want to um, say that the young people in the school scenarios I'm worried about, but I'm deeply worried about the elderly. Again, I'm going to take my community. We just I just had a briefing on the hot spots in St. Louis. They're North St. Louis, largely with an older African American population, a majority of whom do not have internet access. Um, this is really important for us to get a handle on and provide some resolution to. Lest we lose a generation of, of, of who are extremely wise folks for our community. I mean, I I really think that we've got to find a way in this triage stage to deal with those people. They, they they tend to be isolated and they don't have the resources that we need, as you were advocating for in the earlier part of this uh, this conversation. We've got to make sure they get resources. Right now, they are really at risk, and of course, a lot of our older African-American folks have underlying conditions, they've got to be attended to. And I'm deeply worried that we're not going to actually be able to triage them in the ways we should be. <clears throat> All right, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Watson and Grace, let's start with questions that's come from our participants around the country. One of the first questions is, is what does it mean to flatten the curve? That's for any of the panelists. Sure, I can. I guess I can take that one on. So, um, when when you get when you get a new disease that enters the community, it looks like a bell-shaped curve. So it goes up and then it goes down. And um, what happens is you get a lot of sick people that happen right at the peak of that curve. So it goes real up, real high, and then it comes down. So flattening the curve is trying to squash it down so that it, it gets broader. So just understand it gets instead of being a tall spike, it's a little fat bump at the end. What that does is it spreads the number of sick people out over time so that your, hospital, your health system, number one, um, doesn't get all these sick people coming in the door at the same time. Uh, and you can provide better care that way. The second thing it does, if you're really good at it, it reduces the number of really sick people that, that can pot potentially get sick at a time. So, um, that's what we mean by, by flattening the curve. It takes this big spike and making it kind of a fat bump. And, you know, um, let me just tell you, in 1918, in the great influenza, which also was a disease that went around the whole world, um, there were two cities, just, just many, this happened in many cities, but Philadelphia did not do a good job early on in social distancing and had a lot of people that died and got sick. So they had a big spike in their curve. St. Louis, paid a lot of attention to social distancing and they were able to flatten that curve and they got the little fat bump, not the big tall spike. So we know it works. <clears throat> All right. I mean, there are implications as well. If you look at Italy where they had the huge spike, you end up with the medical community having to make some very hard decisions who's gonna have access to healthcare. They um, made recommendations to uh, prioritize people who were younger. We don't wanna do that in America. I mean, we need to really flatten the curve because I think that's the kind of triage decision. I don't want to put our medical uh, staff in the place of having to decide are they going to help a young person or are they going to help someone who's elderly who has chronic conditions. So flattening that curve actually is going to save your grandmother, save your aunt, save, save your mother, because it gives them greater access to health care when they need it. Dr. Cardo, do you want to add anything to that? Not so much. I think uh, my colleagues actually described it pretty accurately and the importance of decreasing that, that curve. Uh, no, nope, nothing to add. All right. That's it. Next question, then. is this airborne, this virus airborne, and how long does the virus last on surfaces? This is uh, Dr. Caudill. I'm happy to address that if that's okay with you all. Um, <laughs> 
so we don't primarily think about this as an airborne virus. It's predominantly thought of as a virus that's transmitted through person-to-person -person contact through exchange of respiratory droplets. A lot of people wonder what that exactly means. What that means is that when you sneeze or cough, the little fluid droplets that sort of fly out of your mouth or nose, those are respiratory droplets. That is what can infect someone else, or that's how you become infected when those land on your mouth or your face and get into your mucous membranes, like your nose, your mouth, your eyes, et cetera. Um, there have been some recent studies that have looked at how long uh, coronavirus lasts on surfaces. Uh, a study that came out in the last couple of weeks uh, this was a controlled study uh, uh, con in a controlled environment that showed that uh, coronavirus tends to last longer on very hard surfaces. So in this particular study, it lasted two to three days on plastic and stainless steel. Uh, on uh, copper, it was four hours. Cardboard, it was 24 hours. The idea here being is that the more porous a, su a substance or a surface, rather, the less likely the, the virus was to, um, to, to stay alive. In terms of airborne, that particular study also showed that uh, the virus can hang in the air for about three hours. But we have to remember that that was a, a very highly controlled uh, study uh, and the the conditions are very, they're not similar to real life. I mean, in real life, you've got weather changes, you got wind, you got environmental stuff. So um, that's sort of almost like a best case scenario in that particular um, uh, experiment. But I think it's best for people to understand that the, the, the main way is through not washing our hands, being within six feet of someone else uh, who may have it, that's how we get it. We get it on our hands and touch our face. We get it from someone else being too close to them through respiratory droplets. That's why we keep talking about the importance of social distancing, uh, while we talk, talk about the importance of washing our hands for at least 20 seconds or uh, using hand sanitizer in the case that we do not have soap and water. Um, it's possible, as I mentioned, that the virus can live on objects and theoretically we can get it from objects, but we do not think that's the likely and most common way that the virus is spread. So that hand washing and hygiene and social distancing is really our way to go. <clears throat> All right. Either one of the other panelists want to respond or should we go to the next question? No, I agree. So we want to go to the next question. All right. While there is no current cure for this virus, are there any drugs that researchers should be currently looking at as a way of curtailing its spread? Well, there are, there are some several drugs that, that have, um, um, that are under, uh, under study. So remember, this is a SARS virus. And we had the SARS-1 virus outbreak several years ago. And so, you know, this is a very different strain of that same virus though. And so there was a lot of studies done on that virus and some early work around both vaccines and, and antiviral agents. And so um, what people are doing uh, is going in and there's some, there's some controlled studies going on right now. Um, we're encouraging people not to, not to experiment um, uh, but themselves. But if you're in one of those studies, we encourage people to, to get in those studies and, and also, let me just say, I encourage people of color to be part of those studies because we are historically left out. Many of those studies are done on, um, on white men. So there's usually not enough women in those studies and there are often, oh, rarely enough African-Americans in those studies. Um, and so it's important that, that, that they have a, a large enough population of all people and then um, enough diversity in those studies so they can say this study, these, this, these drugs work on everyone. So I, I think that's important. Um, but just know, we hopefully we'll see some of the results of those studies um, in, in a few months. I, and I just wanted to add to that, if I could, um, uh, to Dr. Benjamin, what he's just said. A lot of people have heard about the hydroxychloroquine and the chloroquine drugs. Those are the drugs that have typically been used for um, malaria. Uh, they're also used for people with lupus and uh, many um, rheumatological conditions now. So many of, uh, of our people are familiar with these medications for many different reasons. Those are currently being studied uh, at this time. Also, a drug called remdesivir uh, is currently in clinical trials. Um, and, you know, as Dr. Dr. Benjamin said, plenty of, of medications I think are being looked at in addition to a vaccine, which you know the estimates are about a year to a year and a half out. I would also say in addition to medications, 
there are some things that are not necessarily medications, but therapies nonetheless, uh, something called convalescent plasma. That is the idea of, and this is not a new concept, but the idea of using the plasma, uh, which is a blood product from someone who has recovered from COVID-19 and giving that to someone who is currently suffering from COVID-19 in hopes that the antibodies that the, the recovered patient has developed will, will aid, aid the person who is sick. Um, so, you know, that's something on the, uh, on the uh, horizon as well. A number of different options, but, um, you know, we have to wait and see what actually will work. <clears throat> All right, Dr. Watson, oh, Grace, next question. We have a question for Dr. Tate uh, from a college student who wanted you to comment on the impact um, that this has had on higher education. Well, the, the biggest impact um, is for, it depends on who you are, but for, for parents, obviously they have college students who are, who were in residential halls, who are now back home, um, taking classes via Zoom and um, working together as they did like they were high school students. That's a huge deal. Um, it, but I think that when we think about the uh, lear teaching and learning process, um, many schools had to abandon the traditional pedagogical strategy and go to Zoom models. Many schools have gone to almost pass fail for courses this semester. Um, there's a big concern about will summer school exist and what form will it be in for many universities. A lot of students have been given uh, opportunity to withdraw from classes. It's, it's really, um, you know, but I will comment that I think that higher education did uh, as, a, as an industry, the best it possibly can do in the context of a pandemic, and that is get online, get people off campus, social distance um, in a max out form, and then give students an opportunity to complete their coursework this academic year. And what will be uh, a telltale sign, and I think many people are going to have to think through, and I really want to say this you know, in truth and advertising, I think a lot of African-American parents need to look at um, you know, what's the sticker price going to be in the fall as the stock market has been falling and, uh, and your resources are dwindling, or, and you, if you don't have the kind of scholarship money that you may have wanted, you may have to take on another type of higher education institution to sort of cut the cost associated where you are. And I think that's going to be the big, big thing that's going to happen in many places. So over the summer, as this pandemic continues to go, I think parents are going to begin looking at whether or not it just is it a better deal to take the online classes at a community college or am I going to pay $50,000 for this other school and I may not never be in residence there for a year or two years? I think that's the big question that everyone is going to have so to ask. Let me get this right, Dr. Tate. So there's a possibility that there will not be classroom attendance for another year? I don't think anybody wants to say that out up front, but I'm going to say it to you because I, I mean, I think I'm, I'm going to take an advocacy perspective. I think that we have to look at the fact that social distancing might continue. So what's happening? We're now at April 30th, where we're saying that, and then what's what's going to happen? Is it going to be May 30th, June 30th, July 30th? How, how many times is this going to happen? And as we get into the fall, I think that many schools are thinking about and planning for um, using online platforms to continue into the fall. You have to, if you're not planning that way, then you're not stabilizing your system and, and that would be a fail. So I think a lot would depend on the pandemic and where we are with it. But I do think it is definitely feasible that we could be in the fall semester where we're doing online learning and um, at, at, some, at some level, because we don't really know what's gonna happen with this pandemic over the next few months. And you know, I would, one of the things we know is that we have a, a huge, we have several parts of our nation that is a broadband desert, um, where the broadband just doesn't exist in, in adequate um, levels. Um, and of course, many of our students, uh, many of students of color, um, don't have access to broadband. And so we have kids who are obviously, in, we're going outside, you know, fast food places, restaurants to, um, to hotspot to try to get to do their homework. Um, in my in my county, um, they're handing out computers to some of the elementary school kids, and they're trying to beef up broadband because they know that many of these kids don't have access to broadband. Um, what I'm hoping in in as our nation begins to go through this, that they actually put some infrastructure dollars to once and for all make sure that everyone in this country, rural, urban, um, inner city alike, has access to broadband, 
um, and then get the cost down so that people can actually do this. Because I think that just like after 9-11, um, we have now you know, very different uh, experience flying, traveling, going into federal buildings. In fact, going to almost any building. Um, I think this is going to dramatically change the way we live. Um, and you know, may, maybe for the future, because I can tell you that uh, telemedicine, which has always had a really tough time getting started, is just taking off. Um, and so we're going to see a lot of changes in our system because of this. <clears throat> All right, Dr. Watson, Grace, next question. Can there be a reoccurrence and a reinfection uh, after someone has been diagno diagnosed with uh, the coronavirus? I think the current the current thinking is that um, once once you've been infected, you're immune. Um, you know that always remains to be, be 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 shown if that is true, but that has been the historical experience with uh, coronavirus uh, of this strain. Um, Oh, in the past, other strains in the past. Um, but that's the current belief. And of course, we're watching to make sure that that is true. Question for Dr. Benjamin. Uh, how do women and minorities in particular find out where the studies are being conducted so that diversity is increased in the scientific research that you mentioned? You know, that's a good question. I do not know. I don't know if Dr. Connell knows. Um, but now that you've, you've asked me that question, I'm gonna certainly try to find out and try to make sure that I get that information um, both to Reverend Al and maybe to my colleagues at the National Medical Association, but I, I do not know. Uh, this is Dr. Caudill. Um, the FDA and the CDC do have, they both websites has some information about clinical trials. Um, I, I don't know that I can speak to whether it's exactly, we'll say direct numbers and things like that to get into contact with people. But for anyone interested, at least to learn about what trials are actually happening right now, I would definitely start with the FDA.gov and CDC.gov as well. We know how long the germ remains on food. Um, should we be concerned about shopping in grocery stores? This is Dr. No. Oh. Go ahead, Dr. Cotton. Go ahead. No, 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 Dr. Benjamin, I completely agree with you. I was going to say, yeah, no, that's um, that's not something that we should be so concerned about at this time. Something we need to remember is that this virus is not a very robust virus, which means it doesn't do well in changes of temperature, changes in environment and things like that. It breaks down relatively easily. So in terms of food, um, we don't really think about food transmission as a, as a major source of transmission, if any. Uh, we really think of the um, uh, exchange through respiratory droplets and person-to-person -person contact as the major things that we need to be aware of. And let me give you the good public health message that I would tell anyone about any food. Um, making sure you look at the, you know, at the, 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 the sell by date, use by date, um, wash off your fresh vegetables like you normally would do. Um, wash your hands after you go to the, after the, go to the grocery store. Um, when you're putting your cans away, you might wanna wipe them down. Um, but I don't think you have to be concerned about that. I do think you should do practice good social distancing when you go out to shop uh, or you get in the line. Um, I actually um, went shopping the other day and got in line and my cart went over the little red line and I got yelled at by the cashier. Um, he was doing his job. All right, Dr. Watson, Grace. Yeah, there's a question in here about public transportation, um, particularly a number of questions about whether or not um, individuals who take public transportation because they need to get to work, uh, whether or not they should continue. Well, I'll, you know, I'll give I'll no, give my ahead. two cents, and then Dr. Benjamin, I'd love to hear you know your 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 opinion about You're this. Good. Um, yeah, you know there are just some things that we actually may not be able to avoid. Um, you know, it's, and I appreciate the questions because what it means is that we're thinking critically and trying to do everything that we can to keep this virus at a minimum. Um, sometimes the best that we can do is to keep the general practices in mind and employ those the best we can. That means, you know, washing our hands with, for 20 seconds with so warm soap and water, using hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol, avoiding touching our face, staying home when we're sick, uh, disinfecting surfaces when we can. So you say, well, how does that then apply to me riding the subway if I have to get to work? Well, you know, the truth of the matter is there are some people that are simply going to have to ride subways and perhaps public transportation. If you didn't have to, that certainly would be ideal, but we know many people do. So as you're doing so, I would recommend 
um, trying to avoid touching surfaces with your fingers. Um, carry hand sanitizer with you. Wash your hands as frequently as you possibly can. Try not to touch your face. And using those sort of general hygiene principles when you're out and about, also that social distancing, making sure that someone's not sitting right next to you on the subway. Um, but of course, if you have another option that keeps you away from people and exposed to fewer uh, sort of surfaces and elements, that is preferable. Uh, that's my particular take on it. I'd be curious to know yours, Dr. Benjamin. No, I think you hit it out the park. That's exactly right. The, you know, obviously there are things that have to happen. And um, we have people who frankly are, are putting themselves at a little bit of risk um, to go out and make sure that the trash gets picked up every day, that food gets delivered, um, that have to work for us in, in the drive through restaurants we have today. Um, I want to thank them publicly for their for their for their sacrifices and their their hard work. Um, but we want them to be as safe as they possibly can be. And in public health, it's all about reducing risk. So all the things that Dr. Cotto told you are are, are opportunities for you to reduce your risk, and you should practice. So I, I solely agree with everything she said. Would you recommend volunteering, um, civic engagement? Um, is there anything that individuals can do outside of washing their hands to help uh, with this um, pandemic? You know, you know something. Oh, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, okay, are you there? Yeah. Yeah, we're here. Okay. Um, I believe, believe it or not, I'm still, still over here, here trying to, to um, figure out how to get my screen to show. So. I think we lost you. All right, does well, anybody? I'll jump in real quick. Um, there, I just finished a little article for our local newspaper about the fact that there are opportunities to uh, volunteer in a virtual fashion. Of course, we just talked about the fact that the infrastructure related to um, dealing with virtual in terms of the hotspots is, is not consistent across our society, but. There are certainly places where they are taking virtual volunteers. So it's feasible if you're um, desiring to maintain social distance, but you want to uh, be of help to someone, that virtual volunteering is very real. Um, and I think that that's something that we, we really could uh, take advantage of. There are people who just want to communicate with other people right now who, who feel alone. And there are a lot of virtual volunteering opportunities to just have conversations with people and reassure them that they are not alone. And I think that's something we could definitely be a part of. You know, social distancing does not mean the loss of social cohesion. Right. So um, you, everybody knows who, who, the, who the, the people in their community are that are older or need some supports. And to the extent that you can FaceTime with them, call them, um, <coughs> yell them across the, the yard, um, it's, it's important to do. Question actually for Reverend Sharpton, uh, what impact do you believe this will have on the upcoming 2020 presidential race? Well, I think we're already seeing primaries being postponed. Uh, and we do not know, uh, as I think uh, Dr. Tate said, it could be, if we're talking about colleges and schools being pushed back, we don't know if those primary dates that have been pushed back will be pushed back even further. We don't know if we're going to end up with the Democratic Convention scheduled now for June being a virtual convention. And uh, my concern is that we ought to be in the next two weeks starting to pressure the states to prepare for a vote by mail in November. The thing that I'm most concerned about around voting is that we run out of time and they use that as an excuse to delay the November election. Whereas we ought to have them by May start preparing for a mail-in vote so that the election will happen in November, no matter where we are in terms of this pandemic or not. Uh, we should, under no circumstances, let them play with the time clock and not have this election in November. And, of course, that also gives us time to educate people how to do it, to rally people to come out and to protect their vote and have a process to where it is the votes are counted because even in a mail-in voting procedure who's going to count the votes how is that determined because states uh, uh operate and they are the ones that are in charge of elections that's not handled federally so in many states 
you're going to have to really have a, a setup of oversight that our community is protected. Because if you have certain secretaries of state, some of whom are seeking office themselves, that are in charge of that, it could corrupt the process. Next question is how are um, how should health care providers, physicians, uh, protect themselves? Uh, there's a uh, reports about a shortage of um, supplies in hospitals. Is that something you all are concerned about? This is Dr. Cottle. Um, I'm very concerned about it. Um, you know, I'm a practicing physician. I'm I'm uh, not in the emergency rooms. I'm not on the front lines. I'm an outpatient physician, and I'm now doing telemedicine visits with my patients. Um, but you know, I, I've talked to my colleagues every day. We have groups on Facebook and other social media sites. Um, they're terrified. Um, some of them don't want to go to work. Some of them are fearful, uh, especially physicians who have two physician households. Um, they're sleeping on separate floors, staying away from each other, staying away from kids because they're afraid of contaminating the households. Uh, and then, of course, you put on top of that the, the lack of personal protective equipment in a lot of the hospitals um, that just sort of makes for a, a recipe for disaster. Um, it's, it's, it's a trying time, I think, for healthcare providers. It's, it, and it's not even just the lack of PPE. It's also the fear of kind of almost dealing with an unknown. You know, every day in this coronavirus pandemic, we learn something different about the virus. We see different patients behave differently. We learn more about how bad it can be. Um, and I do think this is a, a taking its toll. So there are a number of concerns I have, not only from you know an emotional support standpoint for my physician colleagues and healthcare providers, and and the the, the mental support getting through this, but also the physical um, needs that we have, uh, personal protective equipment, you know, enough people, enough beds, enough things and supplies. Uh, so yeah, I, I do have a lot of concerns in that regard. And let me add, let me add not just the the clinicians because I used to practice emergency medicine, so I'm an old ER doc. Um, and now I'm kind of an armchair um, epidemiologist. Um, but my colleagues who are out there um, doing the disease testing and doing the case finding on the public health side um, are also being stressed. They're having to make very, very different policy decisions, um, like just, just as the, the clinical folks are doing. And so I, I'm also worried about them as well um, uh, in terms of their, their well-being and their burnout. And they've been doing this now for many years um, with inadequate resources. Um, only 3% of the healthcare dollars go to public health and prevention. And so we need to, um, to do better. Um, the good news is to some degree, it says this last bill that was just signed in the law does add some additional needed resources um, for the public health community, but they need to get those dollars down to them as quickly as possible. Do you recommend that the public wear a mask and gloves when they go out, say, to the supermarket? Uh, this is Dr. Cottle. I'll, I'll jump in and make a statement. And um, you know, right now, the CDC does not recommend uh, people who are healthy and well wear masks. Um, and and I think that that's really important for us to adhere to because we're always talking and, and lately talking a lot about the lack of personal protective equipment. Um, we have to remember that masks, the surgical masks that people are wearing, they really are, are only good for, for large droplets. They're not really, really the best for the small droplet spread that we get concerned about with something like coronavirus. That being said, you know, uh, the people who should be wearing masks at this time are people who are ill. So if you are sick, that's a definitely a reason to wear a surgical mask. If you are taking care of someone who is sick, absolutely. Uh, but for healthy people to be wearing masks out and about, um, that's not necessarily the, 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 the recommendation at this time. Remember, we should be limiting our out and about this anyway, right? We should only be out and about for essential items. That means food, for medications, et cetera. Um, and uh, so, so that's my, my, my opinion on it. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, 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 the only caveat I would add is that there are many occupations in which people are out. So cashiers um, and grocery stores, et cetera, you may see many of them or fast food restaurants wearing gloves. Um, and that's because they can't get to, to wash their hands as frequently as they, they, they would like to between every customer. Um, having said that, it's very important that they don't touch their eyes or nose or mouth um, because the glove is just covering up just as though their hand would. And um, so the glove may not be as protective as they as they think, but certainly if you have cuts in your hands or you have a rash, 
um, gloves may be important. Understand these are not sterile gloves. These are these are non-sterile gloves they're doing, and they that still means they have to get out and wash their hands frequently, use hand sanitizer um, as much as they can. Um, you know, the, you see people with masks. Um, they're not crazy, um, but again, we should prior allow, I, because they have such a shortage of masks. I agree with the CDC recommendation that we prioritize those for the um, the healthcare community and folks who are taking care of people who are sick, which may, may be that you're taking care of someone who's sick in your home. How would you assess the rise or the spike in the number of hate crimes, particularly towards Asian Americans? That's something that a number of folks are concerned about. Yeah, we've seen incidents on that, so that's not just some uh, uh, way out question. In fact, I did a segment on that tonight on Politics Nation, but go ahead. It's, it's clearly detestable, and um, we should not um, condone it in any way. We should we should speak forcefully out for that when we hear that against it. Um, and that, that's not just Asian Americans, but we're seeing uh, more cases of concerns of domestic violence. Uh, we got lots of people buying weapons, firearms, and um, we have to be more concerned about um, some of the violence that's occurring, um, knowing that the people that are most likely to be injured with a firearm is someone in your own home. So now we're all in our own homes, and uh, we just have to be, be mindful that lock those weapons up if you have a firearm uh, and practice good safety. Um, you also have to recognize that we're all in a lot more stress, and we're going to have to recognize the mental health aspects of this, both from a societal aspect, as well as for our personal aspects in our families. And so when we're, we're someone in your house is getting in your last nerve, um, go out on the porch, go out on the deck, go up to another room, um, find ways to de de diffuse that because we're, we're seeing a lot of real tragedies that are beginning to occur uh, in our communities. I, I might add to that. We saw in the case in Texas where the governor closed down uh, women health facilities where women would have the right to uh, choose or not uh, in terms of a pregnancy, but they kept the gun stores open. Uh, and this is so in many states uh, that you closing down everything but the gun shops, but, uh, like they're essential. So I think that we've got to be very much aware of that and 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 hopefully uh, not see a backlash in terms of a uh, increase in gun violence. Yeah, as before before we had social distancing on campus, I was deeply worried about the rhetorical stance of uh, naming, quote unquote, the origin of the virus, where it was coming from, and um, what was happening to some of the students on our campus in terms of them being um, isolated and or targeted um, because of, you know, they might be from uh, from from China and uh, or or appear as if they are. Um, it was not a very good situation, and uh, I would say um, we really need to tone down uh, the rhetorical stance about the origin of any virus and really deal with um, preventing its spread as opposed to talking about uh, the country of origin. It, it definitely caused us a lot of problems, and I, I don't think it's very good leadership at all. It's, it really uh, is troubling. Well, let's, let's be uh, candid. It was uh, championed by the president himself, Donald Trump, calling it the Chinese virus over and over and over again, which gave some credence to people uh, that this was, in fact, a Chinese virus. And there were then those that were uh, uh, snake oilmen, oilmen that in, this, uh, in our community, they were saying Black folks can't get coronavirus. And we've seen that to be patently untrue. And now we have many African nations that are now in uh, shut down. Oh, they just closed down uh, parts of South Africa because it's spreading all over Africa. So this kind of misinformation is the reason why we want to do webcasts so we can try to get as many people informed from people that are expert in these areas. And just to tell you how concerning that I am about that, we're now beginning to stigmatize people by state. So if you're from New York and New Jersey, somehow you're more at risk than if you're in Kansas and Oklahoma, when we right. know that every state in this nation has cases. And so you're much more likely to get it from somebody around you um, if you don't social distance than you are from somebody um, thousands and thousands of miles away. Right. 
cities as well. You know, you're from New York City, you're from Detroit. I mean, it's just, it's the same old, you know, game, but uh, it, it's extremely problematic. It's not being framed that you might be in a place with a port, you might be in a place with a large global airport. Instead, it's being framed as it's a certain type of demographic is in that city, as opposed to the realities that we know pandemics spread by way of travel and people being close to one another, density of population, all the kind of environmental factors that would uh, be associated with, in, uh, with some of these cities, as opposed to the demographic realities of the cities. And, and it's extremely dangerous to do that. And let me ask uh, this before they go to the next question. Is it... Uh... Is it true that warm weather brings down uh, the spread of the coronavirus, and uh, and that we may see as as the uh, late spring, early summer months, it go down and then could resurrect itself in the fall as the weather starts getting colder again? Is any truth to this? So um, there's um, a couple of things. I, I think the, the the short answer is we don't fully know at this time. We don't exactly know what the behavior of this virus is going to be. The longer answer, though, is historically we have seen a pattern with viruses where they tend to sort of decrease or spread as diminished in warmer, more humid times of year. Um, and, and, and we see that with the flu virus and other viruses. So it is possible that the coronavirus may follow that trend, but we haven't seen this virus before, so we don't know. I would also say that on other sides, like Dr. Fauci and other um, researchers are speculating that we may see some seasonal trending to coronavirus, that it may sort of come, it may be, become cyclical. Um, but, you know, Reverend, to your, your point about myths, um, you know, one of the things that I do is I, I make videos uh, for the general public about major myths that are out there. And yes, the black people can't get coronavirus is a huge myth that I actually heard when I was in the beauty shop about four weeks ago or three weeks ago or so. But another myth that I'm hearing from people is that heat kills the virus uh, and kind of along the lines of black people can't get the virus. That's that's a, a line or a logic that I've heard many people write to me on social media and say, well, isn't this why we don't have a lot of coronavirus in my home country in Africa or in the Caribbean, et cetera, because you know, heat kills the virus. And I wanna be very clear with people out there that the concept of heat in general killing the virus, drinking warm water, sitting in a sauna, blow drying your nostrils, which by the way, these are all myths that are running around out there telling people that you will kill coronavirus if you use a blow dryer. I've seen the video and it's gotten millions of views. Blow dryer to, to dry your sinuses, sitting in a sauna, drinking warm water, eating broth, uh, drinking broth. Those are all myths. Um, and I really want people to understand that. But in terms of sort of the seasonal fluctuations, and, and Dr. Benjamin, I think you may want to chime in too, but in terms of the uh, whether it's going to go away in the warm weather, we still have yet to see. Uh, but we do know that that does happen with some viruses already. I agree with everything, everything the great doctor said. And let me just tell you, um, the answer is we will know a year from now. Yep, that's right. Next question, <clears throat> should pet owners get their pets tested for the virus? Dr. Benjamin, you wanna do this one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 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 don't do that. There's actually a, a case where they think that that the virus went to a pet, um, but the pet didn't give it back to, to anyone else. And they're looking at that now. Um, it is true this virus probably came, um, it's, a bad, it's a bad virus, um, probably came from bats, most likely through another animal, um, two people in one of these meat markets where they have live animals and, and, and they're slaughtering um, animals for selling. Um, but it's a complicated process, and at least right now, we believe that pets are not uh, are not impacted by that. Again, we don't know a lot, but the evidence looking at many countries so far um, has been that we've not seen this to, as a as a phenomenon. Question for Reverend Sharpton: is, Can you provide an update on where the civil rights community is in terms of advocating for? those who are incarcerated. You spoke a little bit about it earlier. Yeah, we we challenged the president and the Congress, uh, Congresswoman uh, Karen Bass, who chairs the Congressional Black Caucus, is actually trying to uh, produce legislation. You that were on the early part of the uh, uh, calls, uh, heard Congressman Hakeem Jeffries say on this uh, webinar that 
uh, they were pushing this heavily. Uh, and and the, the way I had raised it to the uh, president, what had happened is that the president of the National Urban League, uh, Mark Morial, president of the NAACP, Derek Johnson, and president of the Black Women's Roundtable, Melanie Campbell, and I uh, had done a series of calls that we worked together on. And in it, we said we wanted to call on them to test the homeless as well as the incarcerated. We sent a letter to uh, both McConnell in the Senate and to Pelosi. And then uh, Mark Morial, two or three days later, said, just for the record, you ought to call the White House, Reverend, and leave a message. And I did. To my surprise, Trump called me back. It's the first time we talked since he called me after the election. And he said, well, I hear you. He wouldn't commit to anything. But we wanted to use that as a national platform to continue to drive the issue. And what I said to the president was that even if you won't do it out of a humanitarian concern or moral concern, the fact is that homeless people who can't go to and stay in their home because they don't have a home, many of them not in shelters, they can infect people. I was writing to 30 Rockefeller Center to do my show. I saw homeless people sleeping on the street across the street from Trump Tower. Your rich friends can get infected if you don't test homeless people. People incarcerated can infect each other. If you're in a six by 12 cell, how do you have social distancing when you only have six feet and you don't know if your cellmate is positive or you are positive, or if you are sent home, if you go home positive. So if you can't deal with it from a humanitarian concern, uh, Mr. President, you should deal with it from uh, dealing with the fact that it will only increase the number of potential people infected, which could be people in the 1%. And that was what we raised him. Now, of course, we've not heard from him on it, but we're expecting the Congress to move as Senator, uh, as Congresswoman Bass and others are moving. And you you heard on this webinar, uh, Congressman Jeffrey said that he, Senator Harris, and Senator Cory Booker are proposing legislation in this area. I might add that some states and cities are releasing uh, some people that are, 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 are high uh, risk in terms of age or pre-existing conditions that have nonviolent crimes. I know there are several already released in New York out of Rikers Island, but that is not enough. We want them all tested. And I think there's some things we can do for the homeless in terms, in terms of reducing risk. You know, they have these neat little portable hand washing stations that some cities are putting out for the homeless to give them an opportunity to, to wash their hands. Uh, and as you know, we lock up a lot of the, the bathrooms because we don't want them to go in there um, to the extent the city can, can use as a strategy to provide places for the, for the homeless to wash their hands um, would be a, be a, a great uh, way of reducing the, um, the potential of their infection uh, among one another. We have time for a couple more questions. Dr. Tate, there's a question about the impact this virus may have on historically black colleges and universities. Could you comment on that? Yes, the, the one of the challenges, of course, is um, if you are, um, if your budget isn't robust or you don't have a very large endowment to sustain you um, through these particular times um, and you're a tuition driven university, largely you need people to come. If, if you find yourself with no students, or people, um, or you get a summer melt where you don't get the kind of uh, class that you thought you were going to get, you're going to find yourself in a financially at risk position. I think that there are there will be some set of historically black colleges that may find themselves in that position. This is the time where advocacy for them is going to be extremely important because clearly um, those schools are providing uh, tremendous citizen scholars for us in our in our endeavors day to day. And so I, I think that we do need to attend to making sure they have the support they need, especially to make it through this year um, is foundational for us. I'm very, very worried. Um, many of them are will be fine, but many uh, will not be. And I think this is just the, the right set of circumstances that could harm them and, and many of them could not, may not be able to continue in the ways that they have in the past. So I am worried about that. That's something I've been thinking about a lot. It, 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 quite frankly, it's going to require some for, for many of them a government-related intervention. Absolutely. Let's just be let's let's just call it what it is. I mean that that's what we have to do. So we have to decide that that's a priority, 
and um, they they actually receive the support they need. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Watson. A question, a next question is given the mental health challenges, Dr. Benjamin, that you raise um, and unemployment possibilities, is there a concern about a rise in crime and violence as a result of this pandemic? Yeah, that, that, that that's always a concern. Um, and I know the, the police um, are, are certainly thinking a lot about that. Uh, as well as the human service agencies are looking at it from a broad range of not just domestic violence, um, but also as people um, who have, have daily needs are not able to, to make those needs, um, we're gonna have to be concerned about that. So, um, you know, helping your family members, making sure that we, we, we make sure these dollars from this new stimulus bill, um, um, this aid assistance bill that, um, that uh, the Congressman was talking about, have got to get out to those folks to try to um, stem the tides of, of folks that are um, that are struggling, living paycheck to paycheck. And um, this is this is when I talk about societal cohesion. This is what I mean. We're going to have to reach out to one another uh, across racial lines, across economic lines, across political lines, and try to bring this nation together uh, in a way that we have not seen um, probably for 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 many 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 years. Yeah, I, I like to, I'm going to put my psychiatric epidemiology hat on. And one of the things I'm really wor worried about is that historically um, in the black community, we have not um, embraced um, sort of the services that are can be provided for people who have anxiety, depression, and many other um, uh, psychosocial sort of maladjustments. I, I don't even call them maladjustments. We're, no, there's, no, there's no perfect human being. We all have things that we're, we're managing and coping with. And um, the reality is um, this is only gonna make it worse because people are gonna be separated from many of the, the, the support systems that they historically used. And so I don't wanna say it's gonna increase crime. I wanna say that it's, it, what I'm worried about is that people are gonna be suffering. And, um, and it's in that context of that suffering that I think that we need to be attentive to making sure that we have the psychological services necessary. This is another huge crack in our society that a big mirror is gonna be put up as a result of this pandemic. We don't have the counseling and psycho psychological services that we need at scale in the United States. And it's just gonna manifest itself even more in this context. Yeah, I, was, I was talking to the head of the American Psychological Association about this just the other day. and. Um, you're right, um, Dr. Tate, absolutely. And, and so if you have family members, speaking to those of you in the audience, you have family members that are blue, that um, seem like they're depressed, um, you know, get, get them the help that they need. Um, there, there is telepsychiatry, there is telecounseling you can get. Um, if you don't have health insurance, many of the states are opening up open season again for you to get health insurance, to get the help that you need. There are many county services. Um, that the cities and counties have through the, through the health departments or their public health system that you can get. So I encourage people to get care sooner than later. Let's take one more question before we wrap it up. We're at 827 and we're supposed to end at 830. Last question, then, is there a sliver of hope? Is there something that you all believe is optimistic about the other side? Dr. Collin? Yes, um, I think that's a great question, and it's a great question to end on. Um, I always say we're going to get through this, and I mean it, and we will get through this. This is a tough time. This is a tough time for America, really for the world, to be honest with you. Um, pretty much no one in our uh, alive today has seen this type of thing really to this extent before, and it's going to get worse, but we are going to get better. Uh, and we're gonna get through it rather. Um, and I, I guess what I would leave people is with the hope that we're gonna get through it, but if we focus on the things that we know we can do, uh, I'm hoping that will help us. You know, oftentimes it's easy to focus on what we don't have and what is, what's bad and what's not working, but there are things we do know we can do. And we've said it a million times over and over, not to sound like a, a broken record, but the social distancing and the hand washing and kind of looking after your neighbor from afar and things like that. These are the things that we need to be focusing on right now, and um, we'll get through this. 
<clears throat> let me yeah. go ahead. I'm just going to say the genius uh, that exists in our society is going to manifest itself during this time. And the, the, the outstanding scientists, the artists, and uh, the advocates like you, sir, are going to be at your very best during this time. And I, and I really believe that that's going to get us through. Ditto. Ditto. I think the same thing. I, I get up every morning with the, with the, the hope and the belief that um, our society is going to, to um, um, show its best. And I can tell you that um, um, I, I've been absolutely impressed um, with uh, the, the people of America who have really come down. And when I saw all those folks um, just getting on their balconies and clapping for those healthcare workers the other day, um, it, it was just hopeful. Well, let me say, let me thank uh, Dr. Benjamin and Dr. Uh, Caudill, as well as Dr. Tate, uh, for spending uh, this hour and a half with us, giving us information. People are tweeting that they've learned a lot. Uh, let me thank uh, uh, both uh, Dr. Jamal Watson and Grace for putting this together. And, and uh, we have a large number of people around the country, and I thank you all for getting on this. It's important we get the right information out. Our Nash Action Network will be engaged, continuing uh, with the prepackaged foods, but also educating. I'm on there seven days a week, do a radio show five days a week, three hours a day. We're on two hours on Saturday, and I do an hour on Sunday. We're using all our platforms to educate and also to get people to be active, to go after. I hope you heard what Dr. Tate uh, said about uh, our colleges. I hope we've heard what Dr. Cottle and, and Dr. Benjamin said about where we need to weigh in. We will get through this, but we have to be intentional about it. We cannot sit around like the folk used to do when I was a little boy in church saying the Lord will make a way. He already has. He's given us the wherewithal to do things. We need to get up and use the energy and strength he gave us to do it. God is not your maid that comes and does room service. He gives you the strength to get up and clean up the mess yourself. We're in a mess. We need to clean it up. We need to deal with it. And we need to put people in power that will deal with it. So I thank you for your time tonight. I thank all of the participants. God bless you. Stay healthy. And one thing, be a model yourself and do the things they advise you to do to stay healthy, show healthy, and bring the stress down. Stop those arguments in your house with the cousin that you got stuck with. Learn how to live together. Thank you, God bless you. All right, take care, thank, thank you. you.